author of Page by Page, um, the upcoming book, Dark Matter of Mona Star, and other books that are available here. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, and earlier, uh, so by the time you guys see this, you'll have seen um, her panel where she was talking about creating comics. Uh, so make sure you check that out um, before you take a look at this. Um, so is there anything that you feel unifies your, your different books? Any themes that kind of go across the different books? Ah, they're vulnerable. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess uh, they each are based on how... Hmm, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever asked them that question. Um, I guess emotional vulnerability and drawing out emotions is sort of something I've always been interested in. Even in high school, that was my AP art portfolio, was about drawing emotions. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that it was something that everybody could do, but then I learned that it was a unique skill set, and that if I drew a, about my own emotions, that yeah. other people could actually relate to it, right. which came as quite a surprise, and I felt like, oh, maybe this is something I should put more time into. It doesn't seem right. so selfish. Right, right. so, so you... Emotional um, resonance is definitely something that is common to all of them. So Paige is my anxious, looking for confidence side, and Will is my workaholic, not wanting to deal with trauma side. And Mona is my sort of manic-ish, dep depressive-ish side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so uh, Mona Star, uh, you talked about during the panel, and she's she's a uh, more of a YA uh, character. She's, uh, I think you said 14? Yes. Um, how old is your character in Page by Page? She's 16. Uh, and Will was, I want to say, 17? Uh, so yeah, I've been dabbling around the different you know, young adult ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's very interesting because on the one hand, they're all in that realm where they're um, you're not quite an adult and you're not really a child. You know, you're, you're kind of stuck in there, and yet each of those ages definitely have different um, you know different maturity levels. And and you know, by 17, you most likely don't have everything figured out yet, but certainly more than you did at 14. Yes, I thought 14 was the most depressive age for me. Uh, so that's why I picked it for Mona, because you sort of are, you don't have a car or freedom yet, right. and it's sort of, it's such a point of transition where you're between things. Right. Which I yeah. think makes young adult relatable to people who are not young adults, right. who also experience that feeling of transition and question your identity and where yeah. do I belong. Yeah. Yeah, I, I felt, at least in my childhood, that middle school was the meanest age. It's when, uh, yes, the, the, <laughs> at least from a, from a male-bodied person point of view, that's when the guys are really trying to prove their masculinity and, and everyone's in everyone's face. And kind of by high school, no one cares anymore. And it's really, uh, unlike TV shows and movies, it's kind of very easy to just walk in different circles. I, at least it can be. Um, but middle school, everyone is very unsure of where they belong, you know. And, yes. and, and I, while I, I didn't happen to suffer any depressive thoughts in middle school, I definitely felt a lot of that upon me, you know, at that age. Yeah, I, myself, I wasn't, I actually wasn't depressed, depressed in middle school. I was more, I feel like I struggled more with obsessive, I was an obsessive person. Right. Like my mind was always, I don't know, uh, it would just take me down rabbit holes and I felt almost like a, a victim of my thoughts and my emotions. And because right. also, you, when you're young, you don't necessarily know all your patterns yet. Right. So now as an adult, I know what things trigger me, how things affect me. Right. But when you're young, you're sort of just more responding. Right, everything. right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Oh, and I feel bad for them. <laughs> That's, that learning experience is not right. helpful, and a lot of people don't learn right. about themselves. Right. Because you can just sort of go on autopilot right. and not pay attention yeah. to what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, that your artwork kind of started out as a kind of therapy for yourself putting um, your thoughts onto the page. Um, I think what's very interesting, um, looking through your books, how you've made uh, feeling into metaphor, and it's it's almost the closest I can think of to the superpower I always wish I had, which is to make someone know what's in my head. Oh. You know, because it, you th a lot of times I feel like in any kind of interpersonal relationship, my wife, my kids, my parents, it's that disconnect that causes most of the, the issues, you know? Yeah, and I think that finding good metaphors is a good way to cut through it. Because in our world today, people are arguing a lot over words. Because words right. are so charged with right. meaning. That's one reason I didn't want to use the word depression a lot with Mona. I was like, I'm going to call it the matter. Because people, I don't know, words are, words are challenging. Yeah. And you, people can be arguing about the same thing 
like about a word, but they have two different definitions. So, but pictures, those can cut through. Right. Um, so you can talk about what you're really trying to talk about right. versus the surface right. word of what the label is, because the label right. is just a story. Right. Uh, and looking through a little bit through your Mona preview, I saw um, a scene where uh, Mona's parents are wondering should she get on medication and she reminds them hey the um, doctor or therapist she's working with wants her to kind of try something else first um, how important was it for you to have um, both parents that seem to care and that allow her to be assertive that wasn't a moment of go to your room young lady or something they seem to be like okay let us know when you need help yeah actually the, the medication thing has come up a lot this weekend i feel because I actually, my publisher wanted me to have Mona go on medication to model that it's okay. And I do think it's okay because I think it works for some people, but I, I don't know, antidepressants didn't help me. And I also am very wary about introducing pharmaceuticals into children's bodies when they're right. still developing and growing. Because right. I, I focused myself on sort of, because I'm stubborn and have to do things the hard way. Right. I, when I focused on um, making art to help me, basically I want to understand like what's happening versus, right. and how can I change the problem instead of just hiding it? Because right. I don't know, I felt like that there was also, sometimes there's something in there that's trying to like, my gifts are wrapped in curses. Right. So there right. are lessons in there. So right. I don't need to avoid, it's not about avoiding these right. things. It's like, right. okay, this is just part of how I'm wired yeah. and what things make me feel better. So I definitely advocate trying it like first level you know, changes in your lifestyle. Right. And then like I bring in a lot of like plant medicine, right. you know, and and, um, and like changing my diet right. to help me feel better. Cause also I got a mass in my intestines. Oh no. Um, which is in Mona's story because okay. I was living in my head so much. Yeah. I was just swallowing down a lot of things I didn't want to gotcha. deal with. Yeah, yeah. And I do like, I think it was like the stress yeah. manifestation. Yeah. Cause the doctors said, we don't know what caused it. Yeah. So since then I'd be like, oh, my body and mind are connected. Yeah. Um, yeah, so been, I find that it's a holistic approach yeah. to taking care of, like your mental health is tied with the physical health yeah. and a pill, it, yes, if it works for you, then cool. But I feel yeah. like you should also, like all the other things which are in some ways harder right. to actually work in your real life right. or I want to advocate that even though it's not as cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, and I think we've seen more and more how much your, um, not you, but the general you, your uh, gut, you know, bacteria and so on and so forth really does affect everything up to your mind and back so there it's it's kind of this feedback loop where it's called the second brain it's the same material as your brain right it's the same stuff yeah yeah that's really scary and it looks like it too yeah. like yeah i watched a whole documentary about it because i actually i'm compelled to make more drawings about biology yeah. to understand what's going on in there yeah uh, as an artist because it's amazing. I used to hate the body because right. when you're young, you sort of hate your body. Right. Especially women, you're sort of, right. it's not something that you, it's easy to develop like self-compassion for. Right. So you hide in your head, but the more yeah. you do that, then you're sort of really disconnected and it, it leads to a lot of problems, not yeah. just like physically, but even like, like with intimacy and, <laughs> right. or feeling grounded because I didn't feel grounded. I always felt like I was like floating away. Yeah. And that's where you want to go implode. Right. You know, we yeah. sort of romanticize that, yeah. like yeah. retreating, but like, no, how can I stay here? <laughs> so yeah, actually earlier, I went upstairs after that uh, workshop, right. I found a little quiet spot right. up on the third, fourth floor and just did a little dance party for five minutes. Yeah. And I felt so much better because I yeah. was exhausted, Yeah. but just getting me like reconnected to my body yeah. and that I'm on this plane of existence. Yeah. I'm not in this imaginary right. world. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I think I, I think you brought up so many points that I want to touch on. I mean, first yeah, of all, sorry. you mentioned you may, yeah, you mentioned during the um, the panel that that you're an introvert, and, and one thing a lot of people don't realize is that an introvert is is not necessarily somebody that doesn't like talking. It's someone for whom um, being around other people requires energy, whereas an it's extrovert exhausting. gains energy. Right. So that's why you can be. Uh, a teacher. Are you still a teacher or were you a teacher in the past? I started off as a middle school, a public okay. middle school teacher yeah. in uh, Louisa County, Virginia, and now I'm a freelance teaching artist. Okay. So it's a much healthier balance right. of solitude in the studio and then doing school visits where I can I, like sprinkle the inspiration and you know if I do a, too many of them in a row, like doing right. a Comic Con is overwhelming. Right. Um, so sometimes I'll have like a depressive swing afterwards, right. Right. just like an emotional hangover. Right. 
Um, so I try to balance like the number of teaching gigs with the time in the studio because too much of either is not yeah. good. So yeah. I feel like, yeah, you need to balance the both. Yeah. The other great point you made again about, um, so all you, uh, many of your characters, uh, or maybe all, I'm not sure, is Will a female character? She is. Okay. Our, She's our, my tomboy set. <laughs> they're all female bodied and, and I have two daughters and I think about that a lot, how um, complicated things are in our culture surrounding the, the female body. You know, it's, it's um, there's there's yeah. just so many things, you know, there's, there's and there's the different um, ways people look at things. There are people that are like, your sexuality is something that, that um, men are using to control you, or there's the other side that say, no, we're gonna use it to control you know, where we are, and there's all of that side of it. And um, recently I was reading um, the nonfiction book, um, Breasts, uh, A History, and, and they were saying that the, um, the breasts are the only organ in the, in the human that does not develop uh, in the womb. It comes later. What? And so there's all this, you know, there's, yeah, so there's all this scaffolding that's there waiting and it kicks in when you hit puberty. And so that is why breast cancer is such an issue because those stem cells are what can become cancerous. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they have to have this rapid growth, you know, in the middle of your life, you know. Uh, and a lot of people take care of neonatal issues, but once the kid's out there, you know, uh, yeah. Who knows what they're eating and all those type of things, right? So, so there was a lot of that, and so it's a very complicated thing, and and so to have people talking about it and and um, and being aware of it is really cool, you know. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so it was great that you mentioned that. Um, Actually, a personal comic that I just yeah. made, which um, my agent feels like I should keep developing because I thought it'd be an online content sort of thing, but it's really about sort of a woman's, I don't know. A woman's right to choose yeah. what she's a vessel for because right. I've chosen to not have kids right. and over the years I've gotten so much judgment and right. so much like so also people project a lot of their dreams and expectations right. onto right. you right. if you're an artist like right. oh wow well, you know yeah, yeah. Um, so I was like I need to I love my middle school right. and high school characters right. it's like for, for a minute I need to I need to tell the story to represent me as right. an adult because right. it is a hot topic right now of like women's bodies even right. walking around at comic-con i walk by some tables and they have images of you know fetishized right. redheads right, right. uh in very little clothing yeah. and they're sort of making money off of right. women's bodies that's right. not that's, I, I tend not to focus on that i'm like right. i'm just gonna make better characters than right. you um because i feel yeah. like our side of comics is more innovative and thriving yeah. but there's an audience for everything yeah, but yeah, yeah we need to take charge of the narrative of yeah you know yeah, because if some you don't of that's, like your body, you're not going to take care of it. Yeah. And yeah, it some of that has stuff of becomes so internalized. Like until the Hawkeye Initiative, you know, half a decade ago, I didn't realize like how ridiculous some of the poses are. You know, they're, they're anatomically impossible. Oh yeah, like you know? that Catwoman. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so um, uh, another another question I had here. Let me find it because I had, I have wow. a. Okay. Um, so one of the things you mentioned uh, is your. Um, desire to create a comic that's not a series of, of squares or rectangles yes. that, and and you do have very creative panels and I love that um, both in the indie world and when mainstream comics get to do it um, but what something that's interesting is there's a language behind comics the same way there's a you know a film language or you know even uh, redundant as it may seem a, a book language a way that we write when we're writing you know uh, literature and have you found anybody having issues understanding how to read your page or is it something that kind of just makes sense to people because I was having a conversation mm. last night with somebody not about your book but just having a conversation with someone saying I'm not sure how to read comics I love reading books but I'm not sure exactly how to how to Where you know it. yeah how to do it and and what it means and how much time is passing between frames and and so on so what is your yeah. experience either with the middle school and maybe the kids their brains are just more plastic and they can handle it but what's your experience well I feel like the the first book, I was so, I don't know, comics was such a new language for me. The first yeah. draft, I did a page by page, almost looked more like a scrapbook. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but thankfully, there was one editor at Abrams that gave me notes. She's like, this is comics. Yeah. Um, and I, so I really thought about how can I guide the reader's eye to almost like a dance. Because right. I don't, because I hadn't read a lot of comics and I don't like it if I don't know where to look. Right. Because um, one thing I like about comics is that it's accessible. So it's like, this should be easy and intuitive. Right. Right. So uh, I do feel like there are a couple pages in Will and Wit that might have been a little confusing. 
because um, it was a part where the characters were out. It was like the summertime, and so they're like in the woods, and they're like mattress rafting. And so that section, I had no regular panels. Right. It was divided up by like trees and water. Right. And so I feel like that those pages that might have been, a, you know, I feel like that's the only area that might have been like a little confusing. But even if you read it a little out of order, right. it would have, because I wanted it to feel more loose and unstructured because it's like summertime fun. Right, right. Um, but I feel like that I try to use, I know, I feel like that eyes and arms are sort of my like subconscious visual cues okay. of where to go oh. so when I do my thumbnails yeah. um, like and like the, where you position the faces and speech right. bubbles is really what I focus on when gotcha. I do thumbnails because yeah. you sort of read the speech bubbles and faces like these right. two together then these two together so I would make sure that where I was putting the speech bubble right. was I don't know and also like if there's like a gesture of like someone's doing this or if right. they're looking that so to help make sure that there was a, a flow on each page. Right. Also, my dad, he studied, um, he worked for HUD for like 40 okay. years at yeah, FHA, yeah. and uh, he went to school originally for architecture. Right. And so he talked, he, so growing up, he was always telling me about how things were built right. and designed. Right. And so that I always think of each page as a floor plan, because mm -hmm. he was reading this book called Not So Big House. <laughs> and it said that you should design your floor plan of your home in accor according to how much time you spend in each room. So if you spend most of the time in the kitchen, have a right. big kitchen. You right. don't spend a lot of time in the bedrooms, so have a small bedroom. Right. So I think about that with the page. So what's the, the panel I want the viewer's eye to be looking at the longest, and right. that gets the most real right. estate. And then I'll sort of work on the other panel. So, gotcha. I'll, sort of, like, I'll, so I'll star uh, in a page right. in my script, which right. panel is the most important gotcha. one. Yeah. And so that's how I'll help me focus. Like, okay, okay, the rest will sort of build up to that one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, one final thing, because uh, I could talk to you forever. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm almost out of shop. battery. Yeah. Um, and, and that is, you mentioned during your panel that you like to, um, if, when you're trying to figure out your character, you kind of build them a playlist. And yes. what kind of music do they like? And I noticed in the Mona book, you actually have her playlist there. There's a playlist in each book. Oh, that's awesome. And I've seen some authors, they'll write their playlist that they thought of when they were, you know, working on a book. But I think mm -hmm. that that works really well. Be um, so I, I think, you know, of course, by the time a character gets, by the time a reader gets to that point in the book, they should know the character, but I think it kind of just gives them a little, a little extra. And I, and I think that's really neat. Um, and uh, how does it help you to kind of figure out who they are by what music they listen to? Music is such a powerful part of the creative process for me. I cannot write or draw. I can't do anything in the studio without music on. And I make a lot of playlists. Yeah. I even DJ sometimes at the dance co-op. Um, Cause music is a, in art, we're always a, a mutual love of mine growing up. I grew up okay. playing the violin. Um, and so I feel like that it helps me unlock ideas and get into that sort of fl magic flow space. Um, and also I do feel like that, well, when I was young, I wanted to be a Disney animator. I okay. feel like a lot of kids yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so now it's like I got my wish because it takes maybe an hour and a half to two hours to read right. one of my books and they each have a soundtrack. And actually in Mona, I put in sheet music periodically and I actually made it so it was like a movie so I was gonna have the song lyrics in okay. each one so yeah, yeah. it's almost like those old books like press play here right <laughs> uh, so it was actually like a movie yeah. but my the, we sort of freaked out about having any song lyrics like what if yeah. one of them got upset so we took them out I was very proud of how all the lyrics like tied into the scene yeah, yeah. and fit the mood and it was a solid yeah. playlist transition yeah oh I nerd out about it yeah yeah no, um, I listened to that, the Radiohead album, The Moon Shaped yeah. Pool. When I was writing, I was just listening to that on repeat. Nice. Tom York was definitely a spirit animal yeah. in this production. <laughs> yes, um, uh, Sex Criminals actually did that for one of their scenes with a Queen song. And I think they ended up, after the first two lines, they found something to block every panel so that the words were there, but they weren't there, you know, so they could kind of get around it. Oh, no. Respect all the artists. Um, so is there is there um, anything else that you'd like? Oh. Oh my gosh, I almost forgot the most important question I want to ask you. Um, when I saw your, your little heart there, you mentioned, um, oh, so someone art. asked you during the panel, is there any love interest in Mona? And you said no, and you were saying that there's a, there's, um, well, there's love, but not boyfriend, girlfriend love. There's a different type of love. Um, can you talk about <laughs> the importance of having that in a YA book? Because a lot of them are um, either about that love, which a lot of people do experience, or sometimes if they're really trying to win that award, there's like sex and stuff so that they can be edgy because it's a YA book. 
So can you talk about, you know, having that oh, different yeah. kind of relationship for your characters? Well, my first book, I had a love story, and I feel like that's one reason that it probably got out there more, because let's face it, I, I like stories where there's like little right. romance, oh, smooch. Um, and the second book, I wanted my main character's st love story to be family love, so it's actually about her and her aunt. So to me, that was the big love story, right. is sort of learning how to embrace your own family, because that's right. hard. Uh, so this one, yeah, I wanted it to be an Artner love story, because when I was the most down the well, what helped me the most was collaborating with my partner Larkin right. um, because I was after a bad breakup and she had just had a breakup and we both want, we needed intimacy but we right. didn't want a partner right, right. away. Right. So right. we did a basically for six months we did a collaboration where right. each week we had a theme and we each created something in response to that theme right. and we had like check-ins so it was, it's sort of a model for having a relationship right. but you're just not you know touching physical bodies sure uh sure. it's more emotional vulnerability right. Right. um and it was so enriching and i realized that like this is something that I've always sort of craved in my life and it's always been confusing because right. I never had a label for it because right. I would meet someone and have these sparks and yeah. be like, oh, this person. Yeah, yeah. It's like, but do I want to make love with them? Do I right. want to make art with them? Like, right. I needed another word. Yeah. I yeah. could have saved some confusion <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if I had a label for it because if you look at like, you know, groups, like even like theater kids who right. do a production and they get like right. super close and right. it's like, ah, right. I feel like that's like a clear example. That's like, partner intimacy yeah. it's very connecting yeah. and a lot of us are isolated so um, I wanted that to be part of Mona's story that because my natural inclination when I feel stress is to wall myself off right. that's my first go-to right excuse me I'm going to go implode in this corner because right. that's the nice thing to do right because also in the south you don't burden other people and right. talk about your problems right right um, right but really there's that, part that, of that, that, that uh, song hush hush right uh, the the what is it the pistol something but it's, uh, it's uh, there's one there's one that's it's all hush hush and it's all about letting all the secrets go like oh my brother just got out of jail and stuff like that you know very like hey it's the south we keep things I grew up in Florida so yeah very you know yeah I, I understand exactly what you're saying yeah and so that, but now as an adult I've realized that you know through these different like cycles of patterns yeah. in my life that I have to include other people I have to right. reach out to other people even though I don't like that that's the answer right. But that's the answer. So the, yeah. the rungs of the ladder out of the well are pretty much the people in your support system. So yeah. instead of isolating yourself, actually, when you share those problems, it's sort of, it's interesting because I've learned that I'm normally the first person to open up and admit like, maybe like, I don't know what I'm doing in this situation right. or I feel vulnerable about this. But yeah. the second I do it, then other people do it. Because yeah. it takes someone to go first to almost yeah. like surrender right. and as artists I feel like it's our job like we'll do it first because right. that's right. our part of our job yeah it's being like I'll be the one to admit I'm a human yeah, yeah. like I'm a human too yeah. <laughs> like, yeah yeah so I'm glad you're modeling that in your book because it's one of those areas where the English language lets us down you know uh, I don't know how much my viewers know but you know like in in, Gre in Greek there's like seven different words for love you mm. know and so there's a totally different word for friendly love than there is for love for your parents, than love for someone you want to be intimate with uh, sexually or whatever. And by not having those words, we don't know what to do. Like you said, you feel those sparkly feelings. You're like, yeah. like, wait, am I in love with this person? What does that mean about me? What does that mean about my identity? No, it's like, am I straight? Am I queer? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't happening. Yeah. Was, and if we don't have these words, we need to create new words because we focus so much on romantic love. It is unhealthy yeah. how much we focus on romantic love. And I yeah. think that's one of the reasons. Like, I don't want to have do all these like lovey stories, like right. romantic, because I feel right. like it puts so much pressure. Right. Because if anything, we need to expand our support system beyond our romantic partners. Because right. it's a problem along among a lot of people I know where their significant other depends on them for all of their needs right. versus right. your family, your friends. Like, there's other people. We should all be more supportive even if you're not getting like sex out of it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that's that's a huge, huge thing. So I've taken so much of your time. You have someone over here, you probably oh. wants to talk to you. So um, oh, <laughs> uh, is there anything else you want to tell people before we go uh, about yourself or where to find you or where to find the books, anything? I guess uh, my website is whoislauralee.com. Okay. And I post a blog every week, and uh, my Instagram is Laura Lee Gulledge, and uh, yeah, Mona comes out in April, and yeah. And where's it going to be available? Where Can people buy it on Amazon, uh, Comixology? You can pre-order it. Um, if you Google Dark Matter of Mona Star, okay. uh, you can pre-order through like Abrams and Amazon and all those places. Okay, perfect. All right, so, well, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you for talking Thank you. Me. This was fun.